Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. I'm so excited to have Dr. Daniel Kraft with us today. This is his second time he's been on this show. This time we're going to go deep into everything related to coronavirus and the pandemic and future tech and what we can expect or, you know, just his opinions on what we can expect in the future. He's not uh, a fortune teller, but he is an incredible technologist and futurist and and doctor and uh, speaker. So we're going to we're in for a treat. Dr. Kraft is a Stanford and Harvard trained physician, scientist, and innovator. He's an Aspen Health Innovator Fellow, Chair of Medicine for Singularity University, and Founder and Chair of Exponential Medicine, a program that explores the convergence of technology and its potential to reshape healthcare. Daniel, it's so great to have you on the show. Great to be back with you virtually, and it seems like uh, a, a world ago that I saw you in January in Los Angeles. Now the world's shifted quite yeah. a bit. Oh my goodness. Yes, we were at Abundance 360, which is uh, an excellent an, uh, an event done by Singularity University and, and uh, Peter Diamandis. And it's just, uh, it's a highlight of my year over year. I don't know what's going to happen with the next January. I already signed up and, and paid my 15 grand, but uh, I don't know that it's actually going to be at the hotel. It might have to be done virtually, depending on how things unfold. Um, do you anticipate that um, a lot of events into next year are going to still get canceled as well? I think we're going to see the, we're going to have to see this transition or blend between virtual and real. I mean, we've seen this explosion of virtual conferences in the last month. I was attending the TED prequel yesterday when they're trying to reboot. They've canceled. They not only moved it to July, but then canceled July, and they're going to do a a weekly version, so they're trying to reinvent how TED happens, which obviously is a premier event. Um, Salim Ismail and Ex Ex Expo EXO World Live did one last week, which was actually a, one where it wasn't free and people actually paid to go for three days. Actually, had amazing content. Uh, and I, you know, I chair exponential medicine. I don't think we're going to be able to pull one off at the Hotel Del Coronado this November, given the uncertainties. So how do we kind of make compelling virtual programs? I think it's going to be a question. I've got my Oculus headset. I think we're seeing people build virtual worlds. I think uh, we're learning that we can do a lot of things virtually, uh, and that's going to change how we operate, hopefully, post, post-COVID. post Yeah. Yeah. So speaking yeah. of post-COVID, um, you know, and I, again, I don't want to get you, uh, put you on the spot here to, to uh, uh, you know, kind of fortune tell or anything, but to you what does post covid mean does that mean that we we have a, a a cure or we have some sort of a solution that allows us to be close together and not worry about getting each other sick or does post covid mean it's just a new normal where uh seeing people wearing masks in public is just how it is and trying to stay uh, six feet apart from everybody is just the new normal. Like, wh- wh- what do you see as po- what's your definition, I guess, of post COVID? It's a great question. I think it's going to be a blend, right? We have sort of, we're still the be- maybe we're not the beginning of the beginning, but still in you know, the middle of the beginning phase, right? We're still in sort of relative lockdown. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to kind of get, get restart the economy, et cetera. So it'll have different, obviously, phases and still a lot of disagreement about what are the requirements to get to that component. Um, uh, I, I like to think of post-COVID, hopefully when we have a vaccine that's effective for most folks, when we're able to get back to uh, handshakes and hugs, um, the timeline of that is still has a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I know there's several promising vaccines in trial. There's lots of drugs in trials, obviously things that were hyped like chloroquine uh, by Trump and others have not uh, lived up to the hype. Um, but I'm sort of thinking of sort of the post-COVID world where we're now learning to work more virtually and developing tool sets and mindsets to collaborate. I mean, are we more efficient? I've had like, it's only one o'clock today uh, and I've had like eight different Zoom and WebEx and Skype calls. And I could be a little more productive sitting here than my usual, you know, being on an airplane every uh, every week. Um, so let's just take the healthcare spectrum. I think it'll be different. Obviously already um, there's been a rapid shift to doing virtualized care, telehealth care, obviously. I can now on Skype or Zoom or FaceTime do a, a doctor patient visit with you, and it's now not being blocked by HIPAA rules, which required certain sorts of platforms in the past. And Medicare is paying for virtualized calls. So I think we're not going to go back to this 
pre uh, pre COVID year in terms of how some of healthcare is delivered. A lot of folks uh, are not going to the doctor when they uh, maybe should. We're wondering what's happened to all the appendectomies and heart attacks and other things that used to fill our emergency rooms. Um, so hopefully there'll be some good pieces that come out of this. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of catalyzation in how science is being done and rapid collaboration. Um, and we're sort of you know sciencing the shit out of this, which hopefully means the lessons learned and the collaborations and interstitials will catalyze other solutions, whether it's for global warming or cancer, et cetera. So if there's a silver lining, silver lining to this, even if God forbid a million uh, folks on the planet die from the acute phases of COVID, some of the things that will come out of this will save many millions more and create a basis for better, uh, a better planet, including you know the environment and ways we collaborate and pick up and prevent pandemics uh, and nip them in the bud rather than what's happened in this case. Right. Right. So speaking of uh, uh, collaboration and how we can innovate and come up with with new solutions that help not just people who are suffering from uh, COVID-19, but uh, from other more chronic illnesses, heart disease, cancer and so forth. Uh, what are some of the innovations that you're seeing happen in terms of how people are collaborating, like scientists and uh, you know the researchers and the clinicians and so forth, to uh, fast track different kinds of medications, different kinds of technolo- technological equipment, and so forth. Well, I think if you, particularly in the healthcare realm, it's not like you can just uh, make something and ship it like you can with an app. Um, so you need to have the regulatory things get in line and the FDA. Uh, uh, has relaxed some of their requirements, certainly for developing COVID-related tests, which can be good and bad. You get more tests out there, but they may have not gone through the stringent elements to show that they have relatively good specificity and sensitivity. You can't just throw any drug out there and start getting it utilized because uh, we can see there's a downside. Drugs like chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, had cardiac side effects in the recent data out uh, studies that have, as of this week, uh, in, in in late April. Uh, I've shown that there may have not even been a benefit, maybe a more more deaths on the folks on chloroquine. Um, uh, so I would argue we need not just the technology, but the means to both regulate it and get it out there. Uh, um, I think there's the fierce urgency of now, particularly around all the, the thought about shortage of ventilators. And now we've seen an amazing amount of innovation of folks hacking together, 3D printing uh, ventilators in different parts to hopefully address that urgent need. I think hopefully we're past the need to, to have a bunch of you know 3D printed ventilators, but certain parts can be made that way. We've seen a lot of teams come together. Um, and, I, and I would argue it's now not just about any one technology like a ventilator. We now have a shortage of, let's say, intensive care unit doctors and nurses. There's a lot of intensivity to maintain someone on a ventilator. Um, I spent a lot of time you know, during residency and fellowship tweaking vent settings. Could we create AI and machine learning algorithms to help learn what might the optimal vent settings be for, for coronavirus patients and how do you wean them? And could all those ventilators start to talk to each other and could they have sort of an AI respiratory therapist start to play with that? In fact, um, one of my friends, Godfrey Nazareth, who runs a company called uh, XBiomedical, they've been through some competitions and are rising to the top of the ventilator. It doesn't just do ventilation, but also has some of that built-in AI you know, intensive care unit doctor mindset, which can hopefully be a learning system. And if you can imagine all the ventilators of the world were con- connected, we could almost create that, you know, hive mind that that weighs for ventilator settings so that when something's learned in Italy or New York Presbyterian or Cedar sinai the, the vent settings and the knowledge could transmit to other intensive care units around the world as a small example. Hmm. Yeah, so there's uh, uh, some interesting uh, kind of viral video content out there uh, from different doctors and saying, well, you know, there just seems to be some weird uh, kinds of things going on in terms of protocols and things that go against the best interests of the patient, but it's supposedly for the safety uh, of everyone. Like, for example, it was something along the lines of the, they weren't allowed to use CPAP machines to help people who were suspected of having covid but they uh, uh, had to wait for the person to crash and then put them on a ventilator mm-hmm. uh, because i guess a cpap machine would aerosolize too much of the virus if they do have it even though they're suspected but not necessarily uh, tested and verified to have the virus but just in case you have to let them crash 
Uh, do you know anything about this? Yeah, I mean, there's different ways of ventilating patients or providing oxygen from a nasal cannula to a face mask to intubation, and each have pluses and minuses. And certainly if you have an unknown patient and you put on a mask that's pushing a lot of uh, air into their face like a CPAP, it's going to help uh, virus spread around that room, which requires higher levels of PPE and higher levels of risk. I don't know about waiting for patients to crash. We're now learning that folks act quite hypoxic. They they their CO they're, they're able to ventilate uh, in a sense. Their CO levels are there, so they don't feel as um, air hungry. Uh, but their oxygen saturations are quite low. So how do you usually when you ventilate intubate somebody? They're in extreme respiratory distress. Many folks are being intubated are not yet at that stage. There's even tools to prone them, meaning put them on their belly uh, and have them breathe. That seems to open up some of their lung architecture that might be an intermediate step and prevent people from requiring ventilators. I think I saw a statistic from New York, one of the big New York City hospitals, 83% of patients who were put on ventilators did not make it. So uh, how do we improve, you know, select, maybe some of those folks might have made it if we just kind of gave them a little longer runway and tried some other procedures or, or interventions, um, it may have not. So lots of unknowns here, we're learning a lot. There's different old protocols which may not apply. And I think we need to think about in the entire healthcare system, you know, we have exponential amounts of data, but there's a long way to go from data to knowledge and then knowledge translating to every ER doc or every intensive care unit, what might be best practices. And so I think there's a big opportunity and a lot of catalyzation happening in this moment to help spread information informally. Uh, several physician friends have built uh, platforms where they're crowdsourcing the best known information. JAMA, New England Journal, UCSF, they're all kind of trying to share best practices and, and, and cross-fertilize. So it's a learning time, and, and hopefully that will translate to better therapies for cancer and COPD and, and other elements as we sort of have now this hopefully globalized network of, of medicalized learning. Right, and and that sounds kind of like uh, exponential medicine, doesn't it? Where you're able to uh, ex improve and make exponential leaps in uh, and advances in technology, specifically medical technology, through improved collaboration, through uh, taking advantage of Moore's law and Metcalf's law, and all that. So um, maybe we could give uh, a bit more. I mean, I, I haven't heard the word exponential used so many times in other in this context or others ever, and I think most folks understand exponentials, but it's hard for our brains to still kind of grok it. That's right. Oh, there's only one case. Oh, there's only two. Only four. So the first month doesn't seem very exciting, but then by 30 days in, if you were doubling, uh, or, or 60 days in, if you're doubling cases every two days, you're at a billion, right? And that's that's the power and challenge of exponentials and why, you know, my smartwatch has more, you know, computing power than my uh, little Apple II, uh, sorry, uh, iPhone II, which is an antique, uh, had, mm -hmm. you know, years ago. Um, so the power of convergent technologies can help address COVID. So a small example, uh, we're, we need to go from hospital to home. I call it, you know, ho hospital to homesicle. Monitoring folks at home with little sensors, like a little pile of tools here, like a little intensive care unit level patch can enable you to have a patient not have to stay in the hospital, monitor them with their heart rate, potentially put an oxygen saturation sensor in, you know, you, you can buy an O2 sat monitor for about 30 to $40 online. Uh, oh, is that the pulse oximeter that uh, you're talking about? Yeah, pulse oximetry. Um, and there are a variety of ways to do that. I, I think, you know, the future is having all these exponentials blend into your own sort of, you know, medical tricorder type device that does your temperature, does your oxygen, uh, um, looks at your, you know, respiratory status, your O2 sat, integrates that with machine learning and AI, kind of personalized to you, you know, your weight, your age, your comorbidities, and can help guide you uh, to proactive prevention or earlier diagnostics or smarter, you know, virtualized care. Because uh, again, um, a lot of folks have coronavirus, most don't end up in a hospital, um, most do okay, right? We're still debating the incidence and the mortality rates. Um, but we can sort of leverage a lot of these tools because most people have have what an analog thermometer. Um, so I, I think you know the on top of this telehealth, we don't need to be. If you're if I'm your doctor, it's not or I'm an app based doctor. You don't want to just pop up on the screen and start telling me your problems. You want to hopefully spend time with the chat bot, which has already asked you all the smart questions about your age, your comorbidities, what meds you are on, your symptoms, so that when you pop up on the screen, 
you've already answered those questions. I can see those in context. And then potentially you have your home-based diagnostics device, a portable you know, AI-based stethoscope like this one from Echo that can listen to your heart and uh, even do AI-assisted diagnostics. Or um, I can look in your ears or throat. That might have even been recorded ahead of our exam. So we can use that short five-minute FaceTime component to really get to the crux of the matter and then help guide your, your next steps. And then when I finish the sort of virtualized call, I'm continuing to monitor you with your, with your patch or your Apple Watch and seeing what your heart rate trends are, maybe your temperature. That enables me not to have to keep checking in, but wow, you're not doing well. I get a little ping saying, you know, you've gone from, from, from green to yellow or close to red, and we can then bring you into the emergency room appropriately, uh, not too early and not too late. Right. And so it's like the pre-COVID sort of uh, doctor's appointment was wait in the waiting room, get exposed to all sorts of things while people were coughing and sneezing in, in the waiting area, and then go in, get seen first by the nurse who takes your temperature, your weight, your height, all those uh, sorts of data points. She or he is just basically a data collector not giving you any uh, assistance with anything. And then you wait in the waiting area for the doctor in, in, the, in the room that uh, you, know, you just don't know how long it's going to be before the doctor shows up, and maybe it's a half hour or an hour <laughs> sometimes. And then they spend as little time as they possibly can because they're all backed up with tons of other patients. And uh, so what we're talking about here is kind of the, the future with telemedicine and with all these devices that will be monitoring stuff uh, is that the nurse who's collecting all these data points doesn't even need to be there now. It's just the devices are feeding right into maybe an AI uh, or machine learning algorithm or something that will be able to look for abnormalities, that would be able to uh, alert the doctor to uh, potential issues because of com comorbidities or what have you, and then the, they're off the uh, you know just off and running as soon as uh, the, uh, the the telecall happens. So well, the way, exactly I, what way I'm to summarize it in a nutshell is that you know we don't practice healthcare; we practice sick care. Our sick care model is based on very small amounts of intermittent data. That could be your temperature, your blood pressure, your blood work, your EKG. Usually that only happens when you visit your doctor, hopefully for your annual physical, uh, or if you're in the ER or intensive care unit. So the data is intermittent. Um, so we, have to, we only react to that late. So we have reactive sick care. So intermittent data, these are reactive. You wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack, the stroke, the late stage cancer, the infection, and the potential of a lot of these tools from something as simple as your Fitbit or Apple Watch to the Internet of Things that's going to increasingly measure our health and behaviors in our homes and beyond is to be much more proactive. So we start with more continuous data, which again can come from all sorts of sources. It could be your obviously your base information, your height, your weight, your sex, your medical record, what drugs you're on, but your genome, your microbiome, your your digitome, and then um, as we learn more about what that those data feeds, your your digital exhaust looks like, we can be much more proactive to hopefully optimize, you know, your health to pick up that disease early, whether that's um, uh, you know, uh, something like cardiovascular disease, maybe your sleep patterns are changing, your resting heart rate's gone up 10 points, or even there's not evidence now that your Fitbit or your Apple Watch can pick up the flu or, or potentially coronavirus by changes in your respiratory rate and movement and sleep, and some can pick up temperature, and some are gonna add in pulse oximetry. So again, no doctor or even the patient wants to be looking at all these data feeds and making sense. They need to be synthesized like the check engine light in your car takes 300 to 400 sensors and hopefully gives you early warning, even without not all the detail that you need to take your car into the mechanic to fix the you know piston number three. Um, so that's sort of in a nutshell where healthcare is going to go, and that relates to managing infectious diseases as well as the non-communicable diseases, which create and cause most of the, the mortality, morbidity around the planet. Yeah. Now. Uh, I, I've been reading a bit about how the virus can show up in stools and in, 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 in you know, like in the feces. So um, having the microbiome and the and gut health being monitored as well, I think would be an important aspect of this. Uh, is that part of the kind of digitome of what's being uh, monitored and fed into a, a, an AI and used uh, for telemedicine? 
again, we can start simple, just taking, again, coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, the early you know, signs were, you know, we heard about were dry cough and fever uh, as sort of the classic presentation, but it turns out uh, a good percentage of patients may have just had GI symptoms, diarrhea, for example, and, and fever, and some had predominantly that and not the dry cough, and maybe that later progressed. So you don't need to have PCR analysis of your stool, but it is a, 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 one of those examples of learnings. And Brennan Spiegel, my friend, is a gastroenterologist at, at Cedar sinai and his colleagues at the, the Journal of Gastroenterology have been collating that information. How do you distribute that? Um, yes, you could theoretically be testing your stool, probably not the, 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 the go-to spot for doing diagnostics. But, um, you know, as we learn how this virus works differently in different people, um, we'll need different sort of diagnostic paths. Um, hopefully we'll have, a, you know, home-based versions that can do the acute virals, which usually uses PCR, um, CRISPR, another technology is being looked at as a, a way of maybe doing very rapid um, uh, detection of the actual virus. A lot of the other testing is going to be uh, from your immune response, your IgM and your IgG circulating antibodies, which are responsive. So a lot of the talk about our recovery period or getting back to normal is being able to test you or me or, or folks who may not even know they were exposed and hopefully we have signs that we have an immune response and that will convey protection uh, to future uh, potential infections. We still know that, we do know that coronavirus is uh, mutating. Um, we do know that um, in many other uh, viruses like the influenza, it changes year to year enough for different vaccinations. There's still a lot of uh, uncertainty about our immune responses and who's going to be protected and for how long and what are the implications again for vaccine, vaccines and getting back to work. Right. So if uh, folks can get the uh, disease multiple times and and the antibodies that they get from the first exposure and first uh, sickness of COVID-19 doesn't provide uh, enough immunity to last and they end up getting it again, let's say a year later, uh, that throws a real wrench in the works in terms of uh, us all getting back to work and the economy getting uh, restarted up. Uh, is that right? It could. I mean, there's several different types of vaccines being developed. Some are DNA vaccines, some are messenger RNA vaccines, some are take the classic S protein and make a bunch of that and inject that as the antigen. Um, even in, for influenza, there's several groups working on a universal influenza vaccine, which will hopefully not require us to take an annual flu shot, which is still a bit of a guess each year. Some years it works better than others. So I think, you know, uh, the coronary, cor all the immunologists um, and the vaccinologists are going to be learning quickly. I mean, there's several already in clinical trials. China's even reporting success with one vaccine. It does take, you know, just because you have a test vaccine and started in clinical trials does not mean you can speed up that often nine months to, or year or more process to having a safe and effective vaccine. There have been examples with, for example, vaccines developed for dengue fever and I think even uh, SARS and MERS that in some cases would upregulate the immune system and maybe we'll have worse uh, reactions to a slightly different strain of dengue or, 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 or SARS. So um, there's still a lot to learn and we, we don't want a vaccine to help to have, let's say, take the example, 1% of patients who take the vaccine have a very significant negative side effect when uh, we know that the average mortality rate of coronavirus may be less than 1%. Um, so there's lots of trade-offs here. Right, right. And, and I've heard this term I'd never heard before, the pandemic, called an immunity passport, where once you have uh, antibodies that you would be allowed access to go back to work, to go kind of about your business, but until then, you're under a much more stringent lockdown uh, set of criteria. So um, could you elaborate a bit on, on this, if you're familiar with that concept of an immunity passport? I think the, the basics are, and this opens up a whole conversation around you know privacy and access, is that, you know, let's say, I had a case of coronavirus, whether I knew it or not, and I'm tested and I show I'm positive and that positivity seems to refer to the fact that I won't get infected again, still an unknown, that I have a special you know, digital code on my phone that I carry with me or, or for, through facial recognition that means, boy, I'm able to go into the, into the Walmart without a mask or um, I can go back to certain workplaces or fly on planes. And if you don't have that immunity passport, meaning the, that you've either been exposed and had the disease and have a positive titer, or maybe that you've had the 
ideally a vaccine and are protected, just like we don't let kids start kindergarten before they've had their measles, mumps, and rubella in many parts of the country, um, that you have a more formal digital finger, uh, digital uh, kind of pa immunity passport through vaccine or through having the disease that then is a gatekeeper for what access do you get to certain locations and activities. Um, which will mean different things. When we have vaccines, who's going to get them first? Who gets their immunity first? Uh, who do we prioritize? Is it based on economics? There's lots of social disparities that are uh, coming to light. Not that we didn't have social disparities in the United States and other parts of the world, but now they're even highlighted by the fact that the fact that already, folks who already didn't have good access to regular medical care um, had high incidence of diabetes and obesity, uh, were living in food deserts, didn't have regular access to care. Um, all those are being highlighted in the, uh, unfortunately, the mortality and morbidity rates here. And uh, immunity passport, if the immunity card plays out, may be one of the tools we get back to work. But there's going to be a lot of ethical and other challenges as we as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, there are human rights uh, implications here. Uh, yeah, for sure. Now, I'm, uh, I'm curious about this uh, concept I recently read about called suppress and lift, meaning that uh, we're going to be under tight lockdowns, no schools, all that sort of stuff, and then uh, temporarily those restrictions will be lifted, and then it'll kind of get out of hand with the uh, hospitalizations and all that, and they'll have to suppress again, and it'll be this kind of ebb and flow just to uh, keep the health system uh, from be the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. There's still going to be, it sounds like to me, a lot of deaths uh, from this suppress and lift regimen or procedure. Um, just seems to be pushing out the deaths a little bit. I don't know what's your what's your take on this. No, I think it's quite clear that I mean, I'm here in Cal Northern California. Um, our local county and state folks in, 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 you know, put us into uh, shelter in place earlier than other parts of the country. And every day that that was done earlier has arguably saved thousands of lives um, and enabled our, you know, right now the UCSF, Stanford, those hospitals are not overwhelmed at all. New York City, very different story. Um, we're seeing other states, you know, Detroit, other areas, Detroit and others and places, I can't believe it, you know, Georgia opening up bowling alleys for God's sakes. Uh, that are um, going to end up with higher higher peaks and more deaths. Um, so I, it is going to be a bit of this dance of you know how do we um, you know um, bring down the curve as well as get back to some level of normal activity. And there may be ebbs and flows. And the challenge is it's kind of like you can't just do it necessarily one zip code at a time. It's sort of like if you're in a swimming pool and someone pees in one corner. That P is going to eventually go everywhere. You can't just, it's not local, hyper localized. People travel, people move. Um, and so I think we need to look at the data as it comes out and not rush some, oh, May 1st, that's the date. Uh, we have to look at the data and, and adapt because we're all learning. This is a novel coronavirus and the way it's behaving and how our society and our governmental officials from state to state is highly variable, which leads to very different needs and responses. Yeah. Now, uh, I don't know if you were following what happened in Sweden, but they refused to or cho chose not to uh, require uh, people to, to shelter in place. They asked that folks be just, you know, exhibit common sense. And of course, that didn't work so well. Now the death rate is much higher in Sweden than in any of its neighboring countries. Uh, and uh, yeah, they probably need to locked down and I'm just floored by the uh, stupidity and, and lack of foresight there by the government or the powers that be in Sweden. Uh, are, are you following or have you followed what uh, was happening in Sweden? A little bit. Again, you, you might have just like in any scientific or public health community different perspectives on what might be best and they thought, well, let's get to maybe herd immunity in some form and that will level us off. Um, you know, you could argue uh, un unlock and return to work earlier on the on the behest of our economy, uh, but arguably we do it too early. That's going to have much deeper and darker impacts on our economy if we if more deaths occur. So, I think uh, we learned from the Sweden experiment that that may not have been the best path. We'll still have to see 
what happens in their recurrence rates if they do have some sort of benefit from more folks who've been exposed. Uh, I can't, I haven't looked at the data in detail. Um, we're also learning, you know, interesting elements, again, different parts of Europe versus the US. Uh, interesting data out of New York City looking at the subway lines and even certain subway lines and how that might have propagated disease. All these people going through turnstiles and close quarters. And you can almost track some hot spots of the disease based on a few lines. I know the study that's not yet been uh, uh, peer reviewed has some debate about, its, uh, about its, its methods, but you know we need to adapt. Sweden may be very different than, uh, than uh, rural Oklahoma. Yeah. Now you mentioned herd immunity. Could you go into a little bit of detail on what that means? And I know that there's an equation that uh, takes the uh, R number and uh, I think it subtracts one from the, you subtract one from that and then you divide it by the R number or something like that. And basically all I remember is the final uh, output of that equation was 54% or 55%, something along those lines, meaning that uh, around 55% of the population would need to be immune for herd immunity of the entire population. So that was my understanding. It's very <laughs> limited understanding of herd immunity. So could you elaborate a bit more so our listeners can understand this? I mean, the basic thing I think is you outlined, immunity can come from having the infection or being vaccinated against it. And once a certain percentage are uh, relatively immune, uh, let's say against measles, as a classic example, if, if you know 90% of the kids have measles, even if, if one kid comes in with it, it's not going to start propagating from kid to kid because most of them are already uh, protected. So the herd uh, is is protecting the propagation. If only one percent of the population has been vaccinated or had a disease, it's going to spread like more like more like wildfire. Then R zero will go from you know less than one to three or four, and 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 the number of folks who get it will be much higher. Um, and that's why even we don't just have a pandemic; we have an infodemic. Um, we've had an infodemic around vaccines in general with folks, the anti-vaxxers, um, you know, uh, and the result of that has been deadly. Kids are dying now with measles, a disease that we've had a vaccine for for decades because some parents are uh, not vaccinating their kids, which lowers our herd immunity and exposes many folks, including kids who can't get vaccinated because they may have had childhood cancers, et cetera, at much higher risk. So lots of dynamics here in the vaccine world, the anti-vaxxers, the pro-vaxxers. I think public health the reason we've gone from an average lifespan of you know 40s or 50s, 100, you know 1900 to to 70 plus is because of vaccines primarily, and um, there's a lot of fear mongering um, and misinformation, and a lot of misinformation in even this pandemic about uh, still calling it a hoax in some circles, and um, and pushing um, uh, alternative views that are could end up being severely damaging to lives and to the economy. Yeah, so let's go into this a little bit about uh, uh, vaccines and anti-vaxxers and some of the myths and misinformation out there uh, in terms of vaccines and in particular for ones that might be coming out to deal with COVID-19. So could you share a bit more about that? Well, I think as long as you're you know, a celebrity and you've been on TV, you have the right to uh, uh, now become a spokesperson for the anti-vax movement, often based on people who publish studies that have been completely d d dis uh, discredited um, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because they have a child with autism and they're, they're looking for some sort of excuse and they go, oh, look, it was their measles vaccine, um, you know, which again, to be very clear, there's no uh, actually valid demonstration that vaccines cause autism, but a lot of folks for, for valid or invalid reasons get on that bandwagon and start propagating that. And that ends up impacting our public health system. And arguably many more kids will die from measles uh, than, the, the, than the small risk of, you know, it's no vaccine, no drug, no therapy has no risk. It's always a risk benefit ratio. Um, so I'm been quite disheartened looking at the anti-vax movement over the last couple of years. And arguably that movement is negatively impacting what's happening here as well. The whole um, sort of discounting of science, whether it's for global warming uh, or actual rational science in the setting of pandemic is, is dramatically you know, hurt. It's in the United States, the number one sort of uh, superpower um, who spends the most money per capita for healthcare uh, is, uh, is number one in our uh, ability not to get tests out there and our number one in the, the number of cases 
and deaths per capita. So um, we need to look at the mirror, look in the mirror and hopefully hold our our um, elected officials, some of who are not necessarily elected by the popular vote, um, uh, to account for listening to our scientists and not uh, uh, through the lens of politics. Yeah. Probably enough, yeah. enough yeah. on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, my understanding of uh, some of the previous pandemics, like the Spanish flu and MERS and SARS, which actually, I don't know if those were officially pandemics or just epidemics, but, but uh, there's a second wave that happens uh, in, in, in terms of th these uh, outbreaks. And the second wave can be more deadly uh, whereas the first wave can be more infectious, but the, uh, I, I recall the graphs looking bigger for the second wave over the first wave. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, the, that next wave that'll hit potentially, uh, when we let people start going back to work and hitting the retail, retail shops and all that. Yeah, I think there was, there's been a lot of look back now to, 102 years ago, the 1918 Spanish flu. What, what, what uh, cities? For example, I think uh, uh, you know, Philadelphia that had its parade for uh, uh, for St. Patrick's Day and others that stopped it. They had much higher levels if they had their parade than not. And then also, who maintained smarter wearing masks and public health elements that that lowered their second waves? Because people may not recall, but in the Spanish flu, it went around the world like several times and came back and killed many people. In, in 1919 and even early 1920. So um, I think it means that we're not going to go back to life as normal, at least for the short term, even once we're moving back. We still may be maintaining social distancing or physical distancing, as it should be called. We may be wearing masks for much longer. Um, you know, our social norms of how we get together are going to change. Um, and, and we'll hopefully learn quickly what measures are impactful to lowering those subsequent waves. Um, and, and, and impl implementing them smartly and learning from other nations. So Singapore, you know, they went down to zero cases and now new cases are coming in from other parts of the world and are, are, are re you know, so we need to, again, have a real-time radar and real-time rapid response. Yeah. Yeah. So is that common for the mortality rate for the second wave to be higher? Is that something that people are, are expecting to happen with a second wave of COVID-19? Not being an epidemiologist and public health pure expert, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, I think, but we need to be eyes wide open and, and not assume that, you know, once things have gone down, that they're not going to pop back up, because it's pretty obvious that in many places they will, particularly folks in locations, i.e. Georgia, where they're relaxing things uh, way too early or, you know, op opening up uh, salons and bowling alleys first. You know, there's going to be certain elements that we can get to work uh, in smart ways and hopefully in a staged manner, not just let's open the floodgates and I'll go back to Mardi Gras. Yeah, right. It seems really stupid to have big public venues that are un, uh, unnecessary, like bowling alleys, be the first to open. That just seems ludicrous to me. The bowling alley lobby is strong there in Georgia. <laughs> Apparently. Leadership. Uh, oh, my goodness. Okay, so uh, let's get back to uh, detection of uh, different... Uh, data points from home. Is there a glucose monitoring or uh, detection uh, that that's non-invasive? It doesn't require a, a, a finger prick or uh, a blood draw yet. Like maybe it's based on uh, I don't know, just light and sensors and detecting what's happening with your. Uh, uh, you know, through your capillaries or something? Yeah, I mean, for almost any sort of uh, common lab test, you want to become non-invasive and home-based. I hear about a little, uh, there's a, a, a sensor on the market now, I've got a little here, it plugs into your smartphone and it can do, you know, blood sugar, uh, for example. Right now, those are all basically lab-based, blood-based tests. There's been billions of dollars uh, spent on, um, on uh, trying to create non-invasive light-based sensors for, for blood sugar. Um, some work, but they only work, you know, when you're not sweaty, if you have the right shade of skin, um, 
things. So I don't think anything has yet come to market, but a lot of folks are very, very interested in that. Right now, there are not, relatively non-invasive subcutaneous real-time blood sugar sensors that then even can connect back to an insulin pump, sort of the artificial pancreas model. But right now, there's no yet magical pulse oximeter type light that will detect your blood sugar accurately. A lot of folks working on that. Uh, I haven't seen one uh, yet that looks like it's close to market. Um, but other common things can be measured in interesting ways. Uh, blood pressure, hypertension. About one in three adult Americans has hypertension. Uh, less than half of it have a well-controlled. High blood pressure is the leading cause of early death and morbidity around the planet. Um, and you know the classic thing is to put a cuff on and squeeze your arm and you know maybe do that if you're lucky once or twice a day at home. You know there's now connected blood pressure cuffs. That data still doesn't show, flow to your doctor in most cases, but you might record it on your app. Uh, or your smartphone. Uh, now there are several groups that have worked on non-invasive forms, like almost like a radar system. Um, some devices, you know, the medical tricorders that are emerging uh, can sort of calculate one that aren't yet that accurate. They're pretty good at the normal range, but not when you get super high or super low. Um, but uh, an Israeli company called uh, BioBeats got FDA clearance in about uh, September of last year for a patch-based one, and one that can be based on a phone that seems like it's uh, correlates very well to regular blood pressure cuffs. And that will be a game changer, I think, for hypertension. So that if you're uh, running high or low, because you don't really feel hypertension in most of the cases, uh, you can be much more proactive, adjusting your medications, lowering or changing the doses um, as you go. So that's another example of something getting less invasive. Um, you can use now you know, your smartphone camera to look at the back of your eyeball. That seems to be able to measure everything from uh, your risk for hyper stroke or heart attack to um, to um, many other sort of AI and big data machine learning type diagnostics. You can tell whether you're male or female, your BMI um, and other risk factors. So I think part of the future of healthcare is having a whole set of uh, new ways to measure our physiology, our behaviors. Voice can be a biomarker. You know, if you've got a cold or you've got the flu, your voice sounds as different. If you have, uh, if you're depressed or you're manic, your voice changes. And several groups have now developed um, sort of algorithms to use voice as a biomarker. And I pitched this idea a while ago, could you have a cough, AI cough detector, send, listen to your cough, whether you have a common cold, whether you have croup, remember your kids when they have a croupy cough, sounds like a, you're a barking seal. That's, you know, different sounds of different coughs can now be uh, picked up by your microphone on your, on your phone. And there's a couple of groups now trying to develop like a, like a cough vid. What's the cough that sounds like a coronavirus cough? And what does a cough sound like when someone's really getting worse and might need to go to the hospital? So lots of new ways of picking up our, our physiology uh, going forward. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's amazing. It's exciting where we're heading and uh, getting to that point where uh, what Peter Diamandis refers to as, uh, uh, as escape, uh, what is it, escape velocity for a uh, longevity escape velocity, I think is the terminology he uses for that. That's a bit different. That, that, that's the idea that every year you live a year longer. And yeah, new technologies will come into play that could extend, for every year you live, extend your uh, lifespan by a year and a half or a year and a quarter so that if you live long enough, you know, 30 years, 10 years from now, we'll have, you know, CRISPR-based xenotransplants from humanized pigs. So if you need a heart, a liver, a kidney, you can get one from a pig. Might not be kosher, but you'll take it. Uh, so maybe uh, 10 years from now, we'll have that universal flu vaccine or uh, vaccines that that prevent Alzheimer's from developing, which again, you know, cancer, Alzheimer's, uh, heart disease, all leading causes of, of, of earlier death. And again, it's not about just lifespan. I don't think no, anyone wants to be 120 and feel 120. It's about health span. How do you live to 100, make 100 of the new 60? So you're still mobile and thinking and drinking and moving and, and able to contribute to society in some form rather than being um, um, uh, sitting in a wheelchair and just living longer. Yeah, yeah, great point. So you mentioned uh, CRISPR, and earlier in our conversation you mentioned PCR. So polymerase chain reaction is what PCR stands for, but I'm, uh, I, I wouldn't assume that our listener knows what PCR or what CRISPR are. So if you could uh, elaborate a bit about those two things, that'd be great. Yeah, so PCR polymerase chain reaction is uh, uh, by a Nobel laureate who was surfing at the time. I think he may have claimed that he was on a mind-altering substance when he came up with the idea, but the fact, the basic idea is that DNA 
if you're trying to make a diagnosis or pick up a, a virus, RNA or DNA, it's a pretty small amount of material, right? So what PCR enables you to do is able to amplify that. You have a, uh, a little string of, let's say, the virus RNA. Uh, you have a matching, um, you've now synthesized a bit of code, the ACT and Gs that match that string of RNA or DNA. And you put that into a, a little, basically a, a heating system that can catalyze those to bind and then to amplify and, and um, using the right polymerase uh, magic of recombinant biology, have those double and double on an exponential. So you start with a very small amount of RNA or DNA. And after several cycles, you have you know potentially milligrams or even grams, and that enables you to take a very small signal and amplify it, which is what why it takes often time to do some of these um, viral diagnostics for for coronavirus or other other elements. It's now being used to amplify small amounts of DNA in the circulating blood. So you maybe pick up cancers early. Companies like Grail or Garden have done work in that in that capacity. So that's PCR, uh, and it's been very powerful. Now, just w one thing about this that uh, I think is an important point is if you're massively amplifying a tiny amount of, let's say, the coronavirus uh, uh, RNA, you could get a signal that says you've got it when you your immune system totally had it under control. There was just this tiny exposure, and it's been obliterated a few hours or a few days later and yet it shows up as hey you've got it so um possibly i think um we're going to learn there's, there's something called viral load right meaning you might have just yeah. a small amount uh and it determines if you've got sneezed directly in the face or coughed on by a uh, that's why many healthcare workers young healthy ones are getting sicker and some are dying they may have much higher loads which help the virus take hold and amplify quicker and more quickly because the exponential nature of the growth of the virus you, you start you know with a higher starting dose you can have a, a more rapid uh, clinical course potentially um, so we're still learning there may be you know like folks who get the flu today if you pick it up early you can take uh, Tamiflu which is an antiretroviral and your course of the common flu will be one or two days shorter it doesn't necessarily cure you right away but it shortens the course we may learn for for coronavirus that you know, we can, can detect people early uh, when they're relatively asymptomatic. They take the equivalent of an antiretroviral like rem remdesivir, which is showing promise uh, out by a company called Gilead, which is being used for very sick patients. Might be something you take when you're relatively asymptomatic, or we'll recognize that well, you've got none of the risk factors that means you're going to go forward. So let's just have you let you have a light course of coronavirus. Your immune system is going to respond, and you'll be protected in the future. So I think we'll have different stages: how you treat someone when they're asymptomatic. When they're early symptomatic, when they're just sort of eh, when they're staying at home, kind of like a bad flu, folks who are in the hospital because their oxygen levels are low, and then folks who are in the intensive care unit intubated might need different types of drugs and interventions. And it may be like for HIV, a cocktail of drugs. Um, coronavirus can mutate just like HIV does, and if you just treat with one drug or one antibiotic, we've learned classically that uh, mutations evolve, which uh, lead to resistance. Interesting. Okay, so I interrupted you. You were going to then talk about CRISPR and what that is. Uh, CRISPR is a revolutionary technology invented uh, at a Berkeley and also with some claims out of MIT only like eight or nine years ago. And it's the ability to find a very targeted region of, of the genetic code and to swap out a particular gene. It was discovered based on what certain bacteria can do normally, and now it's been engineered to be able to enable us to target a particular base region and potentially to, to swap it out and fix it. And a classic example might be a disease like sickle cell, which is a, a disease where folks don't make normal red blood cells based on one sort of bad coding, one, one, uh, um, one base pair mutation in the gene for hemoglobin. And that can be identified in most sickle, sickle cell patients. And now clinical trials have gone underway where you take out the bone marrow stem cells, the ones that are going to make, uh, that eventually help make your red cells, fix that one gene, put those bone marrow stem cells back in the patient. We populate them now with these modified hematopoietic or blood forming stem cells. And now we're seeing basically cures of sickle cell patients. Very promising. And that's going to apply to other diseases sickle cell, thalassemia. Those are where we know there's a, pretty much a single gene responsible, some forms of cystic fibrosis. Other diseases, like many cancers, potentially neurologic disorders, um, diabetes, are multifactorial, many genes. Um, 
so it's not going to be a, a, a way that we can just use genetic-based approaches. But So CRISPR has been used, again, in early stages for discovery and potentially for curing diseases. There are some groups that are looking at um, one called Mammoth Biosciences, uh, founded, co-founded by Jennifer Doudna, one of the discoverers of CRISPR, to use CRISPR in, in a way of di- doing diagnostics. You may be able to look at a cell from a cheek swab or whatever, see that it's been infected by being able to splice out and amplify that signal in some way so that you can have a uh, result at home as easy as a urine dipstick for pregnancy. And then when that line shows up, you know, you can take a picture with your smartphone and it tags you as positive or negative. So early days, it's not an, an approved test yet, but an example of the innovation and thought going into new approaches for diagnostics in uh, for COVID. Yeah, real, really exciting. Uh, now, you mentioned earlier the this idea of a medical tricorder, which is actually now a reality. It's not just uh, from Star Trek. And <laughs> now uh, there, there's, I guess, a winner to the X Prize medical tricorder uh, uh, competition. So, what what is available and what's coming in terms of medical tricorders that have all these kinds of diagnosing capabilities uh, in the palm of your hand? Yeah, so I mean, 10 years ago, I, I came up with the idea at XPRIZE. Uh, we had a visioneering around uh, a prize, what I at least called initially the OnStar for the body, uh, that turned into this medical tricorder XPRIZE, a $10 million prize sponsored by Qualcomm and several groups and companies competed in that. The winners were out about two or three years ago, and now they're trying to commercialize their solutions. But essentially, and this is a prototype from one of the competing companies, you know, the idea that you get multiple sensors in one device or, you know, built into your smartphone. Like right now, I have a lot of scattered devices in front of me of devices like the LiveCore EKG, where you can, um, you know, do you, not just a two-lead EKG, uh, but uh, this one will do a six-lead. So this is a device you can buy on Amazon called a LiveCore, um, and, or the Cardia diagnostic. Uh, you may have a, a, a diagnostic that might be a patch that is worn over time to look at your vital signs. Or your Apple Watch now has a lot of sort of tricorder activity. It can pick up heart rate, heart rate variability. I can do an EKG on that as well. So and there's an idea we want to basically simplify and synthesize the ability to pull different data sets in. It could be your EKG, your temperature. Uh, there are devices that can do breath, you know, breathalyzers, and now idea of a breathometer, so maybe look at your breath as a biomarker, that can take the synthesis of that data and enable you to do early triage and early diagnosis. And again, it's not just about the data, it's how you put it together, how you uh, potentially use AI or IA, intelligence augmentation, to, to make sense of that. Some of that will be done on your phone and give you that early ping. Others might be done in, in conjunction with your with your clinician and healthcare team. So. Um, I think, uh, and now there's even portable ultrasound devices uh, that are consumer, $2,000 device on the market, it's called Butterfly, that has some AI algorithms built in as well. So even you can be looking at your heart and kidneys and other elements, and with AI machine learning, it'll help, help you guide the where the probe goes and also help guide the reading of that. And a good, wow. example, a good example might be using that to democratize access in a rural village in Rwanda, a nurse midwife can be, you know, seeing her pregnant patients and seeing is that baby at breach, is there something going on? You know, they don't need to be going to a big hospital. They can get that done at the point of care and then help guide uh, a healthier pregnancy and, and baby delivery as a small example. With well, those same devices are now being used in patients with coronavirus in the emergency room. You can now look at their lungs, not just with an X-ray or an expensive time-consuming CT scan or MRI machine. You can look at the fluid in their lungs and pneumonia through an ultra, a portable, portable ultrasound. And those are now being utilized in, in, in new protocols are being developed and spread as another example. Now that's not a tricorder, but that's got a lot of components of it. It can look inside your body and with all the other sensors and data coming together, then you can really start to move the needle for point of care triage at home or, or in the emergency room or, or beyond. Yeah. Well, what I'm seeing from my experience is a lot of these tools that are just consumer devices like my Y thing, smart scale are, are, little data silos i guess maybe the they're now starting to sync up with the uh with the apple health app so that it's all being uh put in one place in 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 the uh by apple but the smart scale would collect i i use it most days collects my weight my my uh, uh body fat percentage it checks my heart rate and uh checks the co2 level and I think that's about it. And I don't know if it scales charts that over time. 
I don't think your scale does your CO2 level, but... Not my CO2 level, but the, oh, the, uh, the of the room or of the environment. Yeah, because uh, it's just showing me a CO2 level. I don't know if it's getting it from a sensor or if it's uh, getting it from the internet just for my location, for the... Uh, for the city I'm in, I don't know. It should have one. It's probably in your in your bathroom. Um, so the perfect example of that you've got that data. It's probably sitting on your smartphone app. You know whether it's your uh, or even in your health kit data. Uh, so you're a quantified selfer. You, you can track your steps and your sleep and see your sleep score and your steps and your weight and chart that all out. Normally that mm -hmm. lives on your own device. Uh, where I think we're going to shift in the near and distant future of healthcare is from quantified self, where you sort of have all that data, to quantified health, where that's going to flow automatically into your healthcare system. Um, and not that your doctor wants to look at your steps, your scale data, but when things start to get out of whack, you know, it can give you that early ping and warning both to you and to your care team that, wow, you know, your sleep data is off, your resting heart rate's gone from 58 to 72. Uh, we see that your weight has changed dramatically. Maybe you're building a fluid in your lungs and you're in early heart failure, you know, or, you know, so all those things are going to start to be connected. It's starting to happen. The data can flow to my epic, horrible electronic medical records at Stanford, but the, the, the insights from that data is not yet being gleaned uh, in any smart way. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll learn patients like you or healthy folks like you, uh, and we'll start to crowdsource that data. Verily, Google Health, uh, the Verily company is doing the baseline trial to look at what does normal and disease-based patterns look like from wearables and genomes and Internet of Medical things, so that we'll have sort of this new uh, understanding of what our digital exhaust means, so we can be more proactive and preventative and personalized to optimize your health span, to pick up disease early, whether it's the flu or a coronavirus or a heart disease or neurologic disorders early, and then, then bring you therapy that's easier to do, more feedback loop driven, and more effective at lower cost, and can be democratized. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> Sounds like a, uh, an amazing future. You don't so do I would just say for you and anyone listening, you might have hypertension, you may have diabetes, you may have uh, uh, lung disease. You can start to become this quantified self or a quantified healthcare. You can start to measure your blood pressures, store them on their apps, send them to your, doc your primary care doctor whether they want to see it or not in some form. Um, start to synthesize that that data, and hope your healthcare system and providers start to make sense of that as well. So the the future is already here; it's just not evenly distributed. A famous quote from William Gibson, um, and you know you can be part of that process of being at least the CTO of your own health by starting to yeah be proactive and, and make make and make sense of it, and not wait for your doctor or your healthcare system to 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 be uh, on top of it because right now they're not. Yeah, yeah, great point. So we can take. Uh, this into our own hands, start using the different sensors and devices that are out there already. Like I have a pulse oximeter and I uh, check that every so often to make sure that my uh, blood oxygen level is, you know, close to 100%. And if it drops down, that would be a big warning sign that something's off. And uh, especially if, if uh, you've been exposed to the novel coronavirus. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and all the latest tech and uh, what you're excited about and where you see the future heading. Uh, if folks wanted to follow you or learn more or, or you know, get some exposure to this whole area of exponential medicine, where would they go? Uh, you can find me online at danielcraftmd.net. Um, that's one place to see some of my prior talks and writings. You can go to digital.health, which is a new platform I've been building out. Literally, the domain is digital.health to look at some of the emerging digital health and medical tools. Uh, you can look at my last uh, TED talk, which is around this concept I've been developing. I don't know if I have one here of uh, uh, personalized printed medication. So, let's say you have hypertension. You know, the Stefan or the Daniel or the Bob or the Sally pill might need to be different if you could sort of print your own. I'm just here. Print your own. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Your, and doses in there and then eventually that prints at home based on your blood pressure or other elements it would be easier to take your medications because it would be in one pill and it would be easier to dose them because you might need a different dose of aspirin or statin than I do and right now they're all the same dose so you have to cut them in half with a pill cutter so you know trying to catalyze the future of healthcare and then go to exponentialmedicine.com to see a lot of uh, great talks from our prior conferences over the last several years that cross everything from psilocybin uh, for end-of-life care, to uh, drones for drug delivery, to CRISPR and gene editing, to Internet of Things, uh, and beyond. 
Amazing. Sounds fascinating. It's a brave new world. And uh, I'm a fan of Star Trek, so it sounds like uh, Star Trek is on its way. <laughs> Live long awesome. and prosper. Uh, I'll, uh, you, uh, preach it. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. And thank you, listener. Now, please go and explore those websites and check into these uh, different tools and resources that we discussed in this episode. Check out, of course, the show notes for this episode at getyourselfoptimized.com and we'll catch you on the next episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.